Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the third installation of our U.S. Pathways Project webinar series. Uh, last month, we heard from Michael Ginsberg on the research and development priorities for deep decarbonization, and also Aaron Mayfield, who talked about uh, the issues of employment in the low carbon transition. Um, so today we're changing gears a little bit, and we're going to hear from Grace Wu, who is going to talk about the geospatial analysis and planning in the low carbon transition. Uh, Grace is joining us as a Smith Conservation Fellow. Uh, she also works with the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at the Nature Conservancy. Um, and she is participating in the white paper that we're currently working on. Um, so Grace is going to walk through her research to date and some of the uh, points that she's found so far. And then we will open it up for input. And if you're listening to this recording in the future, uh, we welcome you to provide any questions or resources to Grace uh, through email. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Grace. Great, thank you, Elena. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, thank you for that introduction. So here is the outline for the chapter. Um, it will start out with a motivation for why spatial planning is in this white paper, um, and in particular, why it's a critical component of planning low carbon pathways. Um, within the section, there are two areas of focus. The first is renewable energy infrastructure in particular, um, with an emphasis on wind and solar technologies and um, supporting transmission infrastructure. And the second part looks at the reason why agricultural forestry and other land use spatial planning is also critical. Um, in the second uh, part of the paper, we present several frameworks for how policymakers and planners can actually integrate land use into energy planning. Um, providing an example from California that looks specifically at wind and solar energy infrastructure build outs, um, how we used maps of resource areas combined with um, environmental and social constraints to produce maps for where we could site renewable energy infrastructure and then examine it, their impacts on uh, planning of other generation sources um, and then cost, system cost impacts. So within that, we do a site selection process and then there's a transmission path modeling so that we can look at the entire build out in a spatially explicit manner. The second component of the framework section um, looks at the tools that have been used for examining the role of the ag, forestry and other land use sectors um, and how we can anticipate the amount of greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas uh, sinks in the, the forestry and ag sector. Um, and specifically within this area, we also look at how biofuel or biomass facilities um, can be cited in addition to how much feedstock will, um, we, can, we can get from the remaining land area that's not in competition with food production. Um, and then the other non-energy sector emissions. So primarily, uh, where will managed forests be and how do we anticipate that and, and in, enable more carbon storage um, in forest lands? And finally, the last section of the paper um, summarizes points and more importantly, makes recommendations for policymakers and uh, funders and planners, both but federally and regionally. Um, and so there's an emphasis both on federal level action as well as state level enabling actions. Um, so in this presentation, I'll primarily be focusing on those, those areas that have been bolded, which are the renewable energy um, sections within each of the, the, the three primary areas, um, mostly because uh, this is still a work in progress and um, these are the areas that are um, better, have been better developed um, in, in other works that I've been uh, involved in. So to start, 
um, to give you a sense of what this motivation section would look like. Um, the, the purpose is to answer this question of why a low carbon transition is truly also a land use transition. Um, the figure that you see here on the left shows the sinks globally of, of CO2 absorbed. And as you can tell, um, the land sink, which comprises plants and soils, is a very critical land sink and also one that of the most variable and vulnerable as the figure really shows. So in this really clear way, a low carbon transition really requires us to manage these land resources to protect or enhance this carbon sink. On the flip side, from the uh, greenhouse gas emissions point of view, this is a figure of global carbon emissions by sector. Um, we can readily see that solutions to at least 25% of the emissions from the ag and forestry sector will need to come from changes in the way we manage land. So this means avoiding deforestation, increased cover cropping, um, or extending uh, forest timber harvest rotations. We also know that the solutions for electricity sector emissions will require a lot of clean and renewable energy, really all of which require land, um, definitely some technologies more than others. The solutions for decarbonizing these other uses of energy uh, will also require new sources of clean and renewable fuels or electricity, which really further increases the amount of land for renewable energy generation that's required. Um, so to motivate this now in, within the context of the US, um, we'll provide some examples of previous deep decarbonization studies at the national level that um, provide various technology mixes that's required to meet mid-century climate um, targets for the US. So this is a figure of the land area required for utility scale onshore wind and solar farms in the US to achieve deep decarbonization by mid-century using the closest uh, approximate state's land area. Um, though the direct wind turbine impact, so here you see New Mexico, um, the wind farm areas is the area of New Mexico, the direct impact will only be about 1% of this land area. But really siting an area um, the size of New Mexico will, with wind farms will be no easy feat, nor will siting about 26,000 square kilometers of solar PV, which is the, about the land area of Vermont. This is the amount of land that will either need to be converted or managed very differently. Um, and when contrasted visually, with the types of land available in the US, the vast amount of cropland that you can see in the top right and the amount of protected areas in the bottom right, um, you really show, you really can see that the potential siting trade-offs and synergies will need to be mitigated. Um, this is something that we need to manage and anticipate in order to achieve our climate goals. Um, without going into quantitative a quantitative estimate of why siting is a critical barrier to renewable energy development. Um, we can already see in headlines that are that have really come in, um, in the wake of some of the largest solar and wind installations. And a lot of these examples come from California, which is where solar um, development has been ongoing at a, at a very rapid pace in just the last five to seven years. Um, so this has really been a green versus green um, paradox, and uh, a lot of environmentalists are being pitted against each other because of siting issues. Um, and the the reasons for that are are real. That there are truly endangered species at risk, depending on where what sites are chosen. Um, there are large bird mortalities. And depending on the operations of these wind farms, they may or may not be more severe. Um, and there are mitigation opportunities that can be pursued. Um, the last headline on the very bottom was something fairly recent, just in the last year. Uh, the largest county actually in the US basically put a halt on large solar installations. And this is if this is an indication of of decisions to come um, as we scale up even further 
then we need to be able to um, prevent these types of roadblocks from, from, um, from happening. So uh, a recent study um, that's still um, under review and in, in a form of a report looks at what the risks to developers are for siting in high risk areas. So this is an example of um, wind development in the wind belt, which is primarily in the Great Plains in the US. Um, and as you can see on the map, um, the, the authors of the study mapped out low and high risk areas. This is a map of those low risk areas in the wind belt. And they looked at where projects have been canceled and proceeded. Um, and then they also looked at whether or not there was favorable or unfavorable publicity for those particular projects. And they found that an astounding 50% uh, the, the projects were 50% less likely to be canceled when they were located in one of these green low risk areas compared to the higher risk areas. Um, and they were actually less likely to be canceled if they, a 25% decrease in, in cancellation if they receive public, uh, positive publicity that comes with more favorable press, especially from the environmental community. So getting various actors on board and having some consensus building around siting um, seems to play a very large role in the success of projects. One other aspect of siting that um, should really be considered, especially by energy developers in the short term, um, and the reason, the, the really the motivation for why we need spatial planning that, real, that integrates land use in existing energy planning process is that we've seen it across now uh, several studies for the US, um, both nationally and regionally, that there are cost impacts to uh, how sites are selected. And this figure from a study that NREL conducted in 2016 um, shows two supply curves. So for wind, um, the, on the x-axis, you'll see capacity in gigawatts of wind a potential and then on the y-axis you'll see the change in levelized cost of electricity in dollars per megawatt hour. The two lines show two different um, siting scenarios in which there uh, the types of uh, siting constraints were modified and also the degree to which the, the stringency of those uh, criteria were were changed. So in the high siting scenario um, we up, they applied the highest uh, stringency across wildlife radar and distance to human settlement um, elements. And then they relax those in the moderate scenario. And as you can see, the, the two lines diverge pretty dramatically um, at around 500 gigawatts of capacity, which is in some studies, especially some of the earlier NREL studies showed that this is the amount of capacity we'll need by mid-century for the US of onshore. Um, you can see marginally that at 500, the chain, the difference in cost will be 20% um, greater increase in levelized cost over the base case and um, around 5% increase over the moderate siting scenario. Other studies like the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, um, which is affiliated with this particular white paper, looked at more ambitious um, de decarbonization scenarios and a large, much larger penetration of electrification. Um, and they found that we actually need about a, a thousand gigawatts of wind um, by mid-century. And that really puts us up at this very end of, of this divergence. And we can see that between we're going to be experiencing between 40 to 45 percent cost increase um, because of siting restrictions. Um, so being able to anticipate that, account for that in the modeling process, um, and understand how we can mitigate those costs by looking at other technologies. Those are all important um, considerations given the trend that we can already anticipate. So given those, the, this need for looking at siting constraints, um, we, there seems to be um, this, also this need for a framework that uh, allows us to do this type of anticipation in a systematic way. And so we need a, a, a way to help us figure out um, the amount of land use 
for energy infrastructure and where. Um, we need to be able to anticipate some of those impacts on habitat and on communities. We need to understand how those impacts could actually be in turn constraints on energy infrastructure. So the example earlier um, providing that 50% um, reduce likelihood of project cancellation when those constraints are not there. Um, we need a better understanding of that. And whether any of the above affect these electricity system costs and other considerations in energy planning, such as the amount of battery storage or the amount of PV or offshore um, or hydrogen or any other um, levers that we could affect that uh, siting could, could uh, require more of. So to provide an example of what a framework could look like, um, here I'll, I'll provide an overview of um, a process called Integrative Resource Planning, or, or IRP for short. Um, this is a planning or an investment planning process that many jurisdictions in the US have adopted and now uh, several internationally. And it's used um, in both like semi-deregulated and regulated energy markets. At the heart of this planning process is a capacity expansion and production cost model. Um, and this is a, a, an optimization model that allows energy planners to determine the optimal mix of various types of low carbon and, car and fossil fuel technologies that will meet the demand uh, by a certain year. So um, what they what one of the main inputs is really this load forecast, and this is also assuming a certain level of energy efficiency and the and uh, flexible loads and of course uh, for deep decarbonization scenarios this involves uh, assumptions about vehicle and building electrification so the spatial dimension of this capacity this um, modeling process really comes from the renewable resource assessment um, and what we're, we've called renewable energy zones. So areas where energy, renewable energy infrastructure can be developed. And this is really informed by spatially explicit inputs of available land. And that's informed by environmental and social constraints. And all of that is put into a supply curve and, and um, provided as an input into this model. At the same time, we consider anything that's existing and proposed so that we're not double counting land area. Um, and a lot of people ask about distributed energy resources and the role that that can play in um, energy planning, especially to offset some of the impacts that we see with utility scale. And this is where we would come in with, this is an exogenous assumption. It, we take it out of the load forecast um, and we can then inform the amount of renewable energy that must be met through utility scale. And finally, the production cost, the capacity expansion model considers several constraints, one of the most important being greenhouse gas emissions uh, by certain target dates. Um, and with that, it produces these optimal or candidate portfolios um, uh, of resource mixes and the the downstream use of these optimal portfolios is to do a series of risk assessments um, some of which are very common across many irps but um, some of the ones including conservation impact and risk and other land use impacts are currently not um, read, used widely in practice uh, california is actually one of the very few states that do um, are considering any kind of land use impact analysis as part of their IRP process. And then of course, uh, if any of these don't, none of the portfolios meet these requirements, the, the process happens again. Um, and then finally, the optimal portfolios are updated with cost and impact metrics. And then with those metrics, there's a portfolio selection process um, and then a preferred portfolio is selected. So the purpose of a integrated a land and energy integrated framework would include this upstream available land um, informed process uh, informed input and as well as in another intervention in the 
analysis, the compliance check and sensitivity analysis portion of the IRP that then allows land use to be considered in a portfolio selection process, which it currently um, is not being included. So this is an overview of uh, what I mean by that and, and um, in just four steps. So it start, we start out with this resource mapping that's spatially explicit that considers um, conservation and social impacts. And we perform the capacity expansion optimization. Um, downstream of that, we need to gather the social and, and environmental impact. So we do that by spatially explicitly uh, modeling the build out of uh, the wind and solar and transmission. And then we perform an environmental, a strategic environmental assessment of that build out. Um, here is a more detailed explanation of what this means. And I'll, I'll just go, I know it's a, a very um, busy figure, um, but I wanted to point out in particular those, the blue boxes of this process that are spatially explicit and truly what makes this an integrative approach um, that was not, that previously did not exist in um, resource planning. So in the first step, we gather all of the environmental data. So these are maps of where um, prime farmland, rangelands, um, important bird areas, wildlife corridors are located. Um, and these are all spatially explicit inputs and out outputs in blue. Um, this gets fed into a site suitability model in which we use other spatially explicit information and we model areas where we can build wind and solar power plants um, or site transmission lines. And this is a figure on the right, a thumbnail of, of what a solar resource map looks like for the Western US. Um, and then we aggregate that into something that's non-spatial, which is the supply curve. Um, and that's traditionally what's used in a capacity expansion, oh, sorry, a capacity expansion model. Um, and the capacity expansion model, as I mentioned earlier, produces these optimal candidate portfolios. Um, and these are primarily in the form of megawatt or megawatt hours of certain types of technologies. Um, and here's an example of, of what I mean by that. So these are stacks of scenarios. These are different portfolios. And uh, you can see that there are differences in the need for different types of technologies, um, solar, wind being the dominant technologies that are being relied upon, but also geothermal and some and quite a bit of distributed PV. Um, so these are non-spatial, as you can see in the bar chart. What we then need to do out of this traditional IRP process is then do an optimal site selection transmission, transmission modeling. Um, and what we get out of this process are lo actual locations of generation and transmission needs. So in the figure in the, in the small thumbnail, you can see like these areas that have in orange, which are the solar PV um, build out locations. And then the areas in blue are wind, selective wind locations. So now we have these footprints for where power plants should be sited for each of these portfolios. We can then, um, pair that now with these ecological and environmental social data, some of which come from our environmental data collection, and we can do an environmental impact assessment. So we can actually calculate the amount of sensitive land area impacted within each portfolio um, for each of those uh, data sets that we deem are important for energy siting. So this is an example of uh, what I mean by these build outs. So these are spatially explicit, meaning they have a footprint um, and an area located in somewhere geographically. Um, and these two maps show two different scenarios. They differ in what types of land were excluded from the site selection process. On the left, you see the, the high impact. So the higher the impact, the more sensitive habitat uh, or critical habitat or important bird areas would be affected or prime farmland. Um, on the low impact side, these are areas that have lower conservation and social value that have been developed. And as you can see, these build outs look very different from each other. So this is the value of doing the spatially explicit modeling. Um, and now, as I said, with these footprints, 
uh, we can also then take the footprints and figure out what the transmission requirements are to uh, uh, to interconnect these new generation locations to the existing grid. And so everything that you see in blue are modeled and uh, sites and uh, wind sites that have been selected for each portfolio. Um, and all, everything in gray are existing transmission lines and all the green are planned or um, proposed lines in advanced stages of development. And everything in red are the modeled interconnection gen tie lines uh, that will ensure that we get um, these wind farms connected to the grid. And then we can take these modeled lines and then do a further strategic environmental impact assessment and, um, and then be able to actually estimate um, the amount of different types of habitat impacted from transmission planning. And then finally, uh, with those footprints, as I mentioned earlier, we can calculate the amount of land area impacted. Um, this is an example of agricultural lands and rangelands impacted across some of these scenarios. Um, without going into detail, um, basically the, the differences in color, the darker the color, the, the dark color indicates uh, land areas impacted. And so with if you just look at the agricultural lands across these three scenarios, <clears throat> you can see that for solar, which is in orange, the dark orange bars are those areas that overlap with agricultural land um, for solar technologies. And we can see that across all of the scenarios, but predominantly in the in-state and the part west scenarios, about one third to actually one half of all solar capacity is located on agricultural lands, um, which has implications for the way that we manage those agricultural lands and or we should be anticipating that those will go out of production and will use prim be used primarily for energy production. Um, so with us, this type of information, we can then start to think about how we can do the reverse integration or the complementary integration, which is integrating land energy into our land use planning, knowing that these are the type of land uses that would be impacted. Um, and we're already seeing the need for this because uh, even though we are really very much only on the cusp of um, this very large scale up of, of wind and solar um, technologies that we need for deep decarbonization, these two headlines from Oregon and Washington from earlier last year suggest that as our, uh, states are committing to climate goals, food versus energy land conflicts are really already putting up roadblocks. Um, so we know that agrivoltaics, which is a combination of agriculture and PV, has the potential to significantly increase land use efficiency and actually increase crop yields by providing shading for crops under warming climate conditions. Um, so it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. So this doesn't necessarily have to be conflict depending on how we think about the integration of energy in our landscapes. Um, and the potential for wind development on existing farmland in the Great Plains is truly vast, and they provide really economic opportunities. So 40%, this fo photo is from Iowa, 40% of Iowa's electricity is from wind power currently, and it's already brought in millions of dollars of tax revenue, um, funding hospitals and schools. So wind in, the, in these rural areas can actually help maintain their rural way of life. Okay, so changing gears um, just a bit, I don't, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have um, much content yet for the ag and forestry and other land use sectors, but I wanted to give you a glimpse of uh, what I've been able to gather so far. Um, so this will be a much shorter section of the presentation. Um, what we know is that terrestrial carbon seeks are variable and vulnerable, and we see that in the US playing out. So this is a figure um, of a study that looks at forest, carbon sequestration uh, historically, and then projects out the business as usual and under various policy, policy scenarios. And almost, in almost all scenarios, we anticipate a reduction in the rate of carbon sequestration in our forests, um, which is not something that we want to allow to or in, encourage um, if, uh, unless we do some kind of perform some kind of intervention. So we know that an intervention needs to be in place. Um, the, the question is what the extent 
to, of that intervention and uh, the suite of management and policy strategies that need to be in place to ensure a, a an increase or at least a steady uh, maintenance of uh, forest carbon. So this is another example of uh, a more recent study that looks at uh, sequestration over time in U.S. forests, but extends out beyond 2030, which is what the last study stopped at. Um, and the business as usual, the base case, um, does predict sort of this continuation of the status quo, even out through 2100. Um, with no management, the very bottom line, we can see actually a decline in the sequestration rate. So that, that is confirmed by the previous study. Um, and then there are, there's this high demand for forest product scenario with, combined with management in which we'll, we could see much steadier growth in, in carbon um, sequestration. So the way we manage our lands basically largely dictates the amount of uh, carbon seed potential from, our, from U.S. forests. So in terms of frameworks that um, allow us to plan and, um, and be able to com come up with the most um, optimal um, combination of management strategies to ensure carbon seed continuation or, or growth, um, this is a, a small handful of models that have been used uh, for land use projections. Um, and they're called integrative assessment models. Um, the first is a US-based model that's though global. Um, it was produced by a US National Lab. It's called GCAM. The second and third are international models as well. Um, and they um, basically model the forestry and ag sector globally and uh, attempt to understand the role of these sectors in future climate change mitigation strategies as um, both a, a sink and a source. This is a figure from the U.S. Mid-Century Strategy Report for Deep Decarbonization that was published in 2016. Um, they use GCAM to do this, the ag and forestry um, portion of the report. And they looked at forest, they looked at um, observed forest land trends, though we are increasing, the rate itself is decreasing. Um, and they used GCAM to project forest land area and uh, that using that forest land area, understand how much carbon sequestration we can anticipate for the over the next uh, uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, this, these are, so in terms of how useful these tools can be for actually spatial planning, spatially explicit planning. Um, unfortunately, most of these models are not very spatially explicit. The, this is an example of the spatial resolution um, that's used in GCAM. So the way that the market clears is in these agroecological regions, uh, or the, uh, the way that commodities are aggregated are in these AEZs. Um, as you can tell, there are 18 of them. They're very coarse. Um, just in the continuous US, there are far fewer than 18. So um, this is not spatially explicit enough to be able to inform state level um, of ag and forestry management. So we look now at other possible frameworks that have been implemented or developed um, that at the state level that are much more spatially explicit. This is the only one that I've come across so far. Um, so I welcome any other recommendations. So California has um, created something called the CalLand model, which is the Carbon Natural and Working Lands Carbon Greenhouse Gas Model. Um, it was released early in uh, about a year ago. Um, and it basically chooses uh, the several suites of activities. So this is these are the four main areas in which they've applied activities um, in cultivated lands, forest lands, woodlands, and, and wetlands. And they um, they've essentially chosen the degree to which they would extensively manage them. Um, and in, this fig in the figure below the table, we can see that the combination of all of these activities result in a certain number of million uh, megatons of CO2 removed or, or emitted um, by 2030 or 2045. So by 2045, we start to see carbon um, gains, um, actual carbon removed from 
the atmosphere. So this is an example of a tool that California has adopted that is uh, spatially explicit enough to, to prescribe certain management strategies in certain parts of the, of the state to derive quantifiable ben, um, greenhouse gas benefits. Okay, so to quickly summarize, um, the key messages from the energy sector is that truly a low carbon transition is a land use transition. The siting barriers that we're seeing are increasingly important challenges for both cost effective and rapid energy development. Um, how we manage this transition real, through some spatial planning framework can really make utilities feel renewable electricity a threat or an opportunity. And finally, the integration of land use into energy planning processes can really facilitate the local and regional spatial planning of renewable energy um, that will be required to, to truly scale up rapidly. In terms of some recommendations, um, we need more interagency collaboration to produce these types of uh, high resolution maps of environmental and social risks. Um, government can facilitate regional or, or uh, state level zoning of large scale renewable energy development that helps streamline transmission and generation planning. And this is particularly important for transmission planning because we'll need a lot of transmission, as you can tell from those earlier slides, um, because where we lack the economic incentive for transmission build out, we need to have policies that will do, that will drive it. And some of the thorny elements of transmission build out, especially in um, interstate are really cost allocation who pays for it. Uh, regional issues of where uh, states can actually veto, entirely veto lines. Um, and then the what is the role for government? So the government has typically, in, um, in terms of the government in the form of FERC has actually established RTOs, uh, regional transmission operators that help to rule on these interstate transmission disputes. So do we expand that role so that um, fewer instances of vetoing can, can stop uh, long distance lines? Um, and with that, how I welcome any of your feedback and suggestions for improving this chapter. Um, so I'm happy to um, hear any scope suggestions uh, for additional topics, um, especially if there are any other papers or models that I uh, haven't considered yet, um, and especially any other angles to include on the ag and forestry side. Um, any me key messages and then finally uh, thoughts on recommendations for policymakers. And with that, um, happy to answer any questions or please contact me via email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, I'll recommend that you flick it back to your first slide so we have your email on the screen and I'll open up the floor if there's anybody on the line that wants to ask any questions or has any feedback for Grace at the moment. It is the post-holiday quiet. Um, well, thank you, Grace. Uh, this topic is super interesting. Where previously we were really dealing with these macro issues of R&D gaps and employment, um, it's really clear this is a super complicated and very regionally specific issue. Um, thanks for all your work in the California case study and actually especially that slide that you put on looking at the integration of California versus California plus the West and what some of the benefits of looking at it from a regional perspective was really clear. And so I really look forward to seeing how that this part of the chapter comes out and specifically the framework as well. Um, I think building out a framework like that, that we can then apply not just to this region of the US, but you know nationally and across other areas is gonna be hugely helpful for taking this forward. Um, my only uh, piece of feedback, I guess, would be I'd be really curious to look more at kind of the stakeholder mapping of how to take this, these things forward. Um, this obviously takes a lot of different parts of society and government to, to understand, you know, to even just get the data and to input into these modeling. So understanding who those players are um, and how they all could work together might be helpful. Um, <laughs> But so that was the only part that I actually had noted down. But otherwise, thank you so much. I really look forward to seeing how this chapter takes shape moving forward.
Great, thanks for that suggestion. Um, yes, and um, yes, thank you so much for the invitation to present. Great, so Grace's email is on the screen there. Uh, we'll also connect her with the notes uh, following. Um, so thank you, Grace, so much. Uh, we will update everybody in the coming weeks on when they can expect the actual chapters to be released in draft form. Um, and then we'll talk about the future of the project moving into the spring. Thank you, everyone.